testimony how God has saved them. And so I'm asking you from the bottom of my heart uh, to show him respect, uh, not to talk while he's preaching, uh, because he only is here for about 30 minutes, and he's gone. And so his family drove a long way to be here, and so just show him respect uh, as he preaches. So without further ado, Will, you can preach awesome. God's word to us, brother. Amen. So we'll be looking briefly at the book of Titus, and uh, after that I'll be sharing uh, my testimony with you guys today. Um, it's on page 678 of y'all's Bibles, 678. It's actually not going to be on the top of the page because it just says Titus on the top, but 677 is right before that, so it's 678. Um, so the reason why I want to talk about this text is because it, it tells a story uh, that universally all of us, apart from Christ, are defined as being fools and disobedient and led astray and being hated by uh, hated, hating one another um, and all these different things. And so you're either, your story is either that you are still in verse 3 or your story is that you're in vo- verse 7 and that you are an heir of God. We just were singing how uh, he makes the orphan the son or the daughter. And so that's what we're looking at, is that we can become heirs of Christ. And so Titus 3.3, are you all there? Titus 3.3. So Titus 3.3, the verse says, For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved by various passions and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, detesting one another. So this is the condition of humankind Paul, he uses the first person plural pronoun, we, so he includes himself in this statement. He doesn't just point at the people that he's preaching to, but he says, I was once characterized by these things. And the question is, what does God do to save us, to change us from this condition? And it says, but when, verse 4, the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, he poured out his Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. And there's so many things I could say about this text, but the main point is that we go from being foolish and disobedient, being characterized by sin and loving sin, and being hateful of one another, but the cross of Christ is the thing that bridges that gap and makes us sons or daughters of the true and living God. And this is a story of how a hateful rebel of God, one who was once an enemy, has come to be seen as a son of God. I grew up in a Christian family, so my parents taught me right from wrong based on a biblical worldview. The Bible teaches us in Romans 2, 14 through 15, that the work of the law is written on every man's heart and that we all have a conscience. It says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law naturally do the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they demonstrate the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternating, accusing, or else defending them. For the first 15 years of my life, I professed to be a Christian. But I did not understand the grace of God, and I became very legalistic in my understanding of the gospel. It was all based on my own performance, rather than the finished work of Christ on the cross. In the first nine years of my life, we went to a charismatic church, and I would probably recognize some serious errors there now that I didn't recognize back then. But when I was a kid, I loved that church, and for some reason, the whole thing just fell apart, and we went to Harvest Baptist Church when I was nine. My mom started working at Harvest uh, Child Development Center when I was three, and I went there myself when I was very young, so we were familiar with the building, and it was close to home. I had a couple of friends, but uh, I hated the youth group, and there were, there were many bullies there, um, and I only mention this because it's part of the reason I quit going to church. It's important that if you're going to call yourself a Christian, to not misrepresent Christ. Of course, a lot of those kids were false converts, just like I was. At a young age, I always wanted to fit into some sort of clique. When I was nine, for whatever reason, I considered myself a punk. When I was 10, I considered myself an emo kid. When I was 11, I was just being myself for the most part, but I loved skateboarding, so I considered myself a skater kid. When I was 12, I was a, I was a scene kid. I had really long straightened hair in the front and this spiked up peacock looking thing in the back, uh, wearing girl pants and all. And my friends made the joke that I was seen before seen existed. And I, I recognize y'all are probably too young to have any clue what I'm talking about, and that's okay. But you can go on Google later and you can look up scene kids and you'll have a good laugh at that. Uh, when I was 13, I grew curious about smoking pot. And eventually a close friend of mine had some, and we planned on smoking together one day after school. I absolutely loved it. And after smoking it one time, I decided I'm going to be a pothead. I smoked weed every day, and I became fascinated with drug paraphernalia. And I had older friends that had to buy it for me. 
When I was 14, some of my friends were doing ecstasy for the first time. I wanted to know what the hype was about. The same close friend of mine that I smoked weed with didn't want me to try it, and he said I would get addicted. He was right. I hadn't come to terms uh, with this, uh, but I really was an addict. I, I came up with this identity as a candy kid, but ultimately I was an addict. I was consumed with my sin, and I had no concern for God's way. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in that way everlasting. That's Psalm 139, 23 through 24. I memorized this verse before I had any clean time, but I had hoped that one day I would be delivered from my sinful behavior and my fleshly desires, and I would desire what the Spirit desires. In the order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit, Romans 8, 4. When I embraced my candy kid lifestyle, which was really the disease of addiction that I was unaware of at the time, I believed in PLUR. Peace, uh, PLUR stands for peace, love, unity, and respect. Whenever people are under the influence of ecstasy, there is this mutual understanding of PLUR. I could have just met someone, but if we were on ecstasy, we would have both become open and, and love and respect each other, as if we had known each other for our entire lives. Like childhood friends. But PLUR was a lie. Anyone would steal from me in a par heartbeat just to get a false sense that we cared for one another. The process of thinking was, if I steal from you, then I'll be able to love and respect you. I always was curious about what experience or insights I would gain from doing certain drugs. I moved on to psychedelics. I tried acid. I remember seeing everything in a different perspective. It was like understanding the counterbalance of everything all at once. How warm can't exist without cold. How light can't exist without darkness and good without evil. And we called this perspective of thought infinity, infinity. I could not remember life before the trip. It was the only life I could remember. I knew there was something before it, but I couldn't comprehend it. I started to deny the thought that God could possibly exist. The Bible teaches us in Romans 1.18 that everyone knows God, but that people love their unrighteousness and therefore suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The scripture says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without an excuse." God's word says there is no such thing as an atheist because he has clearly revealed himself in creation. Every single one of us is without a defense and without an excuse for saying we don't know God. The reason I claimed to be an atheist after dropping acid was so that I could live comfortably in my sin. Many will claim that the Bible is full of contradictions. But the only thing the Bible contradicts is a lifestyle of sinful rebellion against our Creator. In other words, people make excuses for rejecting God's Word because they love their sin. And this is exactly what I did. In my senior year of high school, I had a relationship with a girl that grew destructive rather quickly. Her name was Lynette. I introduced her to weed, and even though my parents taught me that sex was something to be done only in the covenant of marriage, we engaged in sexual immorality very early on in this relationship. I was in sin, but at the time I had no concern for the holiness of God and no concern for my rebellion against my Creator. But I, if I could say one thing to the young people in the world today, it would be what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12.1. Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Solomon was a wise man in the Old Testament, who for many years had been led astray by his pagan wives. His decision led to the kingdom of Israel being split in two. After living a life of running away from God and living in sexual sin with multiple women, Solomon concludes his life with these words, The end of the matter, all that has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, because this is the end of the matter for all mankind. Ecclesiastes 12.13. Or as Greg Bonson would say, this is the standard of for every person. That is God's commandments. We have an additional exhortation from the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans to not be characterized by orgies or sexual immorality, but to put on Jesus Christ. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The Bible clearly warns about sexual immorality in Galatians 5, but I had no idea. I was a professing atheist at the time, and I had no intentions to know God and was only concerned about my own desires, my own youthful passions, and fulfilling these corrupt iniquities. I introduced her to ecstasy. We both loved it and had a deep connection on it. I was introduced to cocaine and was instantly addicted. I would trade my weed, the hash oil I was extracting, or anything. When I ran out of weed to sell, I started pawning everything, vinyls, video games. I even sold my Force FX Master Replica lightsaber for not even half a gram of cocaine. And now that lightsaber is worth over $1,000. 
I would hide it from Lynette, and I would make an excuse to go to the bathroom to do coke alone. I was isolating myself from her and destroying our relationship and everything. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken are spirit and are life. John 6, 63. If only someone would have told me that at the time. But would I have listened? I started doing meth, and that's when I realized I completely lost control and literally saw demons. Then I came to the realization that God had to be real. If demons exist, then so do angels, and so does God. At the end of my second meth binge, my dad suggested I attend Celebrate Recovery. My throat was so torn up from the meth, I couldn't swallow any food. Now that I think about it, I couldn't even swallow my own saliva. I walked up to the doors of Celebrate Recovery with a melted bowl of ice cream in my hand, very unsure of what to expect. An old man named Tom was at the door and he invited me in. Everyone welcomed me, and it was a little uncomfortable at first, but everyone cared, even though I was literally a dead man walking. During the chip ceremony, I picked up my first blue chip. It said, I'm on the road to recovery. I really wasn't sure what surrendering my life to Christ meant or how working this program was going to change my life, but it did. Some crazy old dude named Doug talked to me and said that I had a long road ahead of me. I wasn't sure what that road had in store for me, but I knew he was right. After all, it said so on the little blue chip. I knew I had come to the right place. I knew I needed change, but I still wasn't ready to let go. When I got home, I didn't smoke weed that night. The next day, I went to work. I started working at Little Caesars a couple months prior. When I first got the job, I just wanted a few paychecks so I could use the money to sell drugs. What I got out of it was much more. I learned about discipline and responsibility, and I can see now that God used the things that I had learned to draw me to himself and bring me to salvation. When I got home that day, I smoked weed. I thought maybe I could just be on what addicts call the marijuana maintenance plan, where you just smoke weed and you don't do the hard drugs. But, and I thought everything would get better, and this plan didn't even last a month, and I went back to the ecstasy. One day, Lynette and I went on a date, and we got into a fight over some dropped leftovers and three pieces of ravioli. Not being in my right mind from all the drugs, things got pretty physical, and I really can't go into detail on what happened. This goes to show how drugs, and more importantly, sin, can bring utter ruin and death into people's lives. That was the end of our relationship. She moved to South Carolina, and she did let me go visit her for a week, and I spent $1,300 in the process, but we both knew it was over. Now, when I got back to Texas, my addictions were more out of control than ever before. I was doing X three to four times a week and seven mo- for seven months, and that seventh month ended with a 10-day binge. One night, I was on a number of psychedelics and stimulants and even downers. I left my house to get cocaine and glow sticks, leaving my buddy Jacob at my house. When I got back, Jacob was talking to my dad. I remember seeing them through the window and thinking we were in trouble. My dad was completely oblivious to the fact that we were high. When I walked inside, we all sat down in the living room. The conversation we had was a pivotal point in my life. Looking back now, I clearly see the work of a sovereign God working to draw me, a foolish, hateful rebel, to himself. During this conversation, my dad told me that years prior that Tom, the guy who invited me into CR at the door, and some other guys at a men's breakfast prayed for me. It really got me thinking. I thought about Celebrate Recovery and how I was running from God. Jacob went home shortly after that, and I invited my friend Cameron over. I told Cameron how I felt, and after a couple days, he was going through a withdrawal, and he wanted to go to CR. At this point, I had convinced myself that I was just tripping, and I wanted to keep living the way I was living in my sin and transgression. But when Cameron said he wanted to go, I said, if he wants help, then we're going. When we get there, I was so excited. I was seeing all these people I knew, um, Gary, Joel, all these guys, Tom, Marty, this, this crazy old guy, Doug, was even there. The one who told me I had a long road ahead of me. It was as if God drew us all there that night. When we worshiped, I cried out to God. I realized I didn't have to live that way anymore. God chose me, and Christ died for me, and had nothing to do with what I did or what I'm going to do, but what he has already done for me. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. That's Hebrews 10.10. That's a powerful verse. Jesus died once for all so that we wouldn't have to make sacrifices anymore, and God never took pleasure in sacrifices in the first place. It was a symbol that sin is death. That night, I ran into one of my old drug dealers from high school named John. He was actually at the recovery meeting. He had been sober for a year, and he was on fire for Christ. And he shared an encouraging word with me. He told me that being sober was like being a little kid. I trusted his sincere and kind words. John was right. I did feel like a little kid, and I knew that with the power of God and surrendering to Christ, I could get sober one day at a time. It's amazing. I wouldn't have even went that night if Cameron didn't want to go. But his being in my life fulfilled God's plan and purpose, and looking back, it showed God's sovereignty in action, especially since Cameron never got sober and kept walking in a lifestyle characterized by sin and death. A couple of days after the meeting, I knew that I had to stop desiring drugs, girls, materialistic things, and money. For roughly 30-ish to 40 days, that worked, but I missed my old life of sin, and I missed hanging out with my old friends. In the drug culture, it's easy to hang out with someone every day when you have drugs, but when the drugs are gone, so are the supposed friends. I felt alone, and John was my only Christian friend, and he was often very busy at work. 
I planned my relapse a week prior. I justified smoking weed because I was already going to have to take painkillers for the impacted wisdom teeth that I had. I in instantly, I was smoking weed, taking Percocet and Xanax. A week later, doing ecstasy and coke again. A month later, meth. I hadn't done meth in nearly a year at this point. My friend Parker from the Little Caesars told me that your addiction does push-ups when you're sober. I was on a week-long meth binge, and I was taking Xanax and Oxy to come down and balance it out so that I would be able to eat food. I remember thinking, this isn't hurting me as bad as it used to. I just needed some downers so that I could eat. Every day waking up, my first initial thought was meth. On April 21st, 2015, I woke up with the same impulsive desire to smoke meth. I knew I had to eat something first, and I was struggling to get any food down. I began to cry out and say, it doesn't have to be like this. I was supposed to trust in God. I would have had three months of sobriety that day had I not relapsed, but instead, I couldn't even eat a bowl of life cereal. I was completely hopeless. I'm only sharing this graphic detail of addiction to display how out of control and truly powerless I was. About to do the same thing all over again, I was driving home from Cameron's house and began crying out to God, praying the parts of the serenity prayer that I remembered, which is a prayer they teach in their recovery meetings, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I kept saying that, God, grant me these things. Grant me the serenity to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. So I'm saying that to myself, and I pulled up to my house, and I sat there for an hour in deep spiritual warfare. When I got inside, I called my friend John immediately, the one who had been sober for a year who used to be my drug dealer. He prayed in the middle of a J.C. Penney. He was there shopping with his mom. I realized God never left me, and that entire time he was still there. I just tried to escape. The Holy Spirit filled me at that moment. I had been regenerated. I surrendered my life to Christ. I flushed my meth down the toilet. I drove to Lynette's old house to smash my meth pipe and put it all behind me, only moving forward now. The sketchy times were over. God saved me from the snares of darkness that I was once trapped in. Christ came to set the captives free. In Colossians 1.13, we see this glorious reality for all who have been saved. It says, who rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We as sinners who have fallen in Adam are characterized by darkness. Yet we see that God the Father rescues sinners from the power of darkness and instead places us into the kingdom of the beloved Son. God is in the business of dragging dead sinners out of the depths of their evil and granting them a place in the kingdom. The hope that we have is that we can be redeemed by the Son and receive the forgiveness of sins. Does anyone know how redemption is defined? How would you define redemption? If you don't, that's okay. When we talk about the concept of redemption, we're talking about this concept to buy back. In order for someone to buy something, they must have ownership. You see, because God owns all things, he is able to redeem his people. He is able to buy back those who are slaves of sin and make them slaves of righteousness. We see this taught in Revelation 5.9. It says, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood, you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. R.J. Rush Dooney commenting on this text says, to redeem in its basic meaning means to buy back, buy again or repurchase and always refers to property which has passed out of the hands of the original owner, whether by sale, by security or of a loan and which he buys back under the laws of governing such cases. Only the original owner, or someone acting on his behalf, has a right to redeem property. Thus, Jesus Christ enters history as our next of kin to redeem us from the power of sin and death and restore us to paradise, to the kingdom of God. After God saved me, I was discipled, and by God's grace started memorizing a lot of scripture. As I was growing in grace and holiness, I came across a ministry page called Jeremiah Cry on Facebook. The one who founded this ministry is Jeff Rose. Jeremiah Cry is an open-air preaching ministry comprised of multiple preachers who take the gospel out into the streets, all throughout America, Scotland, England, and now even in Taiwan. When I was young in the faith, I would watch Jeff Rose preach with boldness. Even when faced with hatred and opposition, he proclaimed Christ because Christ is worthy to be praised. Here was a man who could say with the Apostle Paul, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. To be a Christian is to have all of life characterized by living for Christ. Even our deaths should be characterized by Christ. I wanted to share my faith the same way that Jeff did. I wanted to be bold for Christ and unashamed of the gospel. I probably watched his videos on and off for two to three years, and then by God's grace, I had the opportunity to meet Jeff and proclaim Christ in the open air with him. One day in 2018, I visited 116 Bible Church. It is called 116 after Romans 116, which says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. When I visited his church, I met Palmer, 
Jeff, and Jeremy Roten, who was the elder at 116 and, and now has gone home to be with the Lord. We eventually made a plan to bring the gospel to the streets in a wealthy town called South Lake on a Saturday night right after Thanksgiving. I love preaching the gospel right before Christmas because he's the whole reason for the season. It's all about Christ. I remember when we got there, we started out by passing out gospel tracts. If you don't know what that is, it's just little cards with the gospel on them. And then Jeff put the microphone on Palmer and told him to preach. After Palmer proclaimed Christ crucified, I was eager to go next. My heart was racing, but we had been diligent in prayer and asking God to guide our speech and help us to be faithful to the text of Scripture. As soon as I turned on the amp and began to speak, my heart stopped racing. And all the Scripture I had been meditating on for three and a half years were flowing out of my mouth. I preached on Romans 3, Philippians 3, and Titus 3. All of these texts testify to the reality that we have not lived right before God, but that even though we are great sinners, Christ is a great Savior. And He is able because He has ransomed us by paying, uh, by paying the debt on the cross. And now we can be declared righteous by faith in him. It is all a free gift and not by any good works or deeds we can perform. After that night, Jeff told me he wanted me to join 116. He also told me that I was valiant for the truth. And even though it was my first time preaching in the open air, he said, it is like you've been doing this your entire life. From that moment on, I had found my main calling. I remember getting my first amplification device in the mail and thinking to myself, my life is not my own. Christ owns me and I will live as a faithful servant to him. I started preaching Christ in the open air consistently on most weekends. We would go to South Lake, Arlington, Fort Worth, and eventually Denton. I met my best friend Cody on the streets of Fort Worth. We were both new to open air preaching, but we immediately connected and I started preaching with him often. One Saturday night in September, on September 2019, we decided to go to Denton Square. We wanted to go out there because Denton is a college town and as Christians, we are called to challenge unbelieving worldviews and every thought that is contrary to Christ. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, 2 Corinthians 10.5. After Cody and I preached a few times, we realized that some other brothers and sisters in the faith were on the same, or on another corner, excuse me. And so we walked over there and joined them. This is the night I met my wife, Abby. She was already there with her dad to pass out gospel tracts and share the good news of Jesus Christ with unbelievers. We talked about tattoos and donating plasma, and she actually laughed at the things I was saying. Cody was nudging me in the arm to imply that there may be hope for me with this blonde girl wearing an abortion is murder t-shirt. We were not unequally yoked, to say the least. Of course, I wasn't there at that time to find a life. But God in his sovereignty had a plan from before the foundation of the world that this event would happen. The same night as we were evangelizing, I talked to a strange character by the name of Two Feathers. It's okay to laugh about Two Feathers. I know he told you not to laugh, but you can laugh about Two Feathers. Two Feathers claimed to be a Christian, but all he wanted to do was talk about the Nephilim and other difficult passages of Scripture, and he didn't really have an understanding of the gospel. I asked him the question, how can a man be made right with God? And he, he kind of mumbled under his voice. He wanted to get on the mic and preach with us, but we wouldn't let him do that. But he, he talked like this. He was like, uh, uh, so, so there's an atheist here, and then he goes to church for a little while, and then and after he's at the church for a little while, then, then he's a Christian. And that's how he talked. It like, but it was like that for like 15 or 20 minutes. So after the outreach, when Cody and I were walking back to the car, he made a joke that he was prophesying that Abby would be my wife one day. He was right, but it actually wasn't a prophecy from God. It just happened to work out that way, and it's quite hilarious looking back. On December 7, 2019, I asked Abby's dad, Anthony, if I could court her for marriage. He agreed. We were engaged by May 10th of 2020. I proposed on the same corner of Denton Square where we first met, and the courtship lasted seven months and three weeks. We were married on August 1st, 2020, and it all started with two feathers. Now, <laughs> now I don't only evangelize on the weekends. But God has blessed me with a full-time evangelistic ministry, a wife and two daughters. When I do something, I'm all in. It used to be directed towards drugs, but all my idolatrous, uh, addictive behavior was changed because of God. And now I am sold out for his son and for his gospel. I went from starving for more drugs and basing my life off fear and loathing in Las Vegas uh, to uh, being grateful for God's grace. The good news of the gospel is that God saves sinners. Christianity is not behavior modification. It's about being reconciled to a holy and righteous God. A God who we have absolutely nothing to offer to. We bring death upon ourselves, and he brings life. I am now an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador is one who speaks on behalf of a king to a foreign country. When we come to the lost world, they are foreigners who we represent King Jesus to, so that he can give them new life, and that we could become, or that they could become ambassadors too. Excuse me. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteous of God. Christ was made to be sin. He had to die because sin is death. He died the death that we deserve, but he was sinless. He knew no sin. 
This is the only way to bridge the insurmountable debt that we owe to God. If we have faith in God, we are already clothed with the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ, and nothing can take that away. When we fall, we get back up and look to the glorious cross of Christ. We die in the death of Christ and now live in his righteous robes. We are told in Colossians 3.3 that all who have faith in Christ are hiding in Christ. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. My life is hid with Christ on high. God is now a friend of me. We're no longer enemies. I view success differently now too. I thought selling weed and having money was being successful, but now I know sharing what Jesus has done for me and sharing my testimony of God is more successful and has eternal value rather than temporary value. I could have 10 cents in my bank account, but if I'm sharing God's word, that's more successful than anything the world has to offer. All that other stuff is temporary. I was chasing lies. I would say, all I want is to be trapped in euphoria. Life in Christ, I say, all I need is to be free in Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not reject the grace of God, for if righteous were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. We can't make it on our own. We need the perfect work of Christ because God's law demands perfection. Christ even said this in Matthew 5, 48. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. But this verse is not implying personal perfection, but the perfection that is counted to us by faith in Christ. And to the one who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. Romans 4, 5. Again, Paul repeats the same truth in Romans 5, 6. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Spurgeon once said of these texts, It is God that justifieth the, that justifieth the ungodly. He is not ashamed of doing it, nor are we of preaching it. Remember Martin Luther's way of cutting the devil's head off with his own sword. Oh, said the devil to Martin Luther, you are a sinner. Yes, said Luther, Christ died to save sinners. Thus he smote him with his own sword. Hide in this refuge and stay there. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. My identity is no longer in a clique created by the culture of death. I'm not just some addicted candy kid blabbing on about plur. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, and my identity is in him. Everything else will always come to an end, but life in Christ is everlasting. I'm grateful to know Jesus, the one true and living God, that I'm saved by his grace, and it has nothing to do with what I've done or how well I perform, and it makes me want to seek him and know him more. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his worksmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The call for you is not to minimize your sin because you hear my testimony and think your sins are, my sins are much more than yours, although that very well may be the case. The call for you is to confess your sins to the glorious Savior who has defeated death, hell, and the grave and take refuge in the righteous robes of Jesus Christ. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes for righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses for salvation. So you see, you can believe on Jesus for righteousness, his righteous life credited to you as a gift. And you can confess, confess him as Lord, confess your sins to him, and he will save you. He will deliver you from your darkness and all of your sin, all of your iniquities. The promise of the new covenant is that he would remember your sins and your iniquities no more. And don't say that you don't have any sin or don't say that you're not that bad of a person because if we say we have no sins, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all of our unrighteousness. All of our deeds, all of our evil deeds, all of our evil ways, all of our darkness can be cleansed by the blood of King Jesus. Jesus taught us that those who believe are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. But if you would be found in Christ, the verdict from the judge and from our Father is that there is now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you for this time. And God, I just pray that um, these kids would grow to fear you, that you would use them mightily for the sake of your kingdom. And God, that they would trust in the righteous robes of Christ, that they wouldn't chase after drugs or euphoria or materialistic things. God, our, our hearts are... are factories of, of making idols, God. And I just pray that that wouldn't be the reality here, but rather, again, that they would fear your name and that they would keep your commandments, not looking to their own performance, but looking to the perfect work of Jesus Christ, calling on his name and knowing that if they would confess and believe that they would not be put to shame 
and the verdict would be innocent. The verdict would be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And it is in that glorious Savior's name that we pray. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. Um, we're going to have some leaders oh. in the back. And uh, if you heard Will's testimony of how he gave his life to drugs, how he gave his life to sin, sexual sin, how he gave his life over to all.